It's Friday. It's 12.15 and we're live in Westminster. Joining me today, Aaron Bastani from Navarra Media, the journalist and broadcaster Toby Young, women's editor of The Daily Telegraph, Claire Cohen, and Miata Fanbule from the New Economics Foundation. So we've gone from 10 to 7, and now this morning, another one has dropped out. The Health Secretary, Matt Hancock. The party clearly is looking for a candidate to deal with the here and now. Um, I've very much put myself forward as the candidate focused on the future. He may be in third position, but Michael Gove says it's still all to play for. I'm looking forward to the next round in the contest. I'm very pleased to have had uh, the support from my parliamentary colleagues. And Boris Johnson is still not saying very much, despite being the favourite. Chuka Amuna, the former Labour and Change UK MP, has switched parties again. This time, he's picked the Lib Dems. If you want to end austerity, you cannot do that if you are going to sponsor Brexit in the way that the two main parties are doing. And a new video game set in a post-Brexit Britain is causing a stir. Does it offer a realistic portrayal of our future? Let's start with Chuka Amuna, who has switched parties. He's defected to the Liberal Democrats. This, of course, we'll show this tweet from him two years ago, where he said, whatever common ground we may have with Lib Dems and some Tories on Brexit, I can't forgive what they've done to my area. Well, that's obviously all been forgotten because he is now going to be joining the Liberal Democrats. Should he, though, call and trigger a by-election? My personal view is that anybody who goes from one party to another or becomes an independent should be subject to a by-election. But I think it's particularly great and given that he's now going to represent three political parties for the same constituency in less than six months. I think it really is a slap in the face for the electorate of Streatham. What do you think, Toby? I think that it's easy to ridicule Chucker for having taken a rather roundabout route to get to the Lib Dems. Uh, but actually, I think this poses a real threat to the Labour Party. Let's not forget that the Lib Dems uh, beat Labour, and they beat Labour in their strongholds in London, even in constituencies like Islington during the European elections. Lots of Labour voters are unhappy about Labour's uh, 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 constructive ambivalence over ambiguity, over Brexit. They're unhappy about the uh, Equality and Human Rights Commission's in investigation into Labour for anti-Semitism. Right. They don't think Corbyn's fit to be Prime Minister. So I think this is a journey that lots of Labour voters could go on. And actually, I think Chuck will probably hold his seat at the next general election. Right, so no by-election? I don't think it will be a by-election, no. Should he call a by-election for the constituents of Streatham, to pick up on Aaron's point, don't they have a right to have a say? They do, but I think I don't think it's necessarily straight away. I think, actually, with all this flip-flopping, he might well have damaged his own brand anyway. Um, you know, saying... I mean, it was only three or four years ago that he tweeted, it was being shared widely this morning, that he would never wear a yellow rosette. So I think all of his indecision might well have damaged him anyway. And, you know, his comments this morning that he overestimated how difficult it would be to start a new political party. Mm. I wonder if... Uh, underestimated. I mean, I mean, I wonder whether he might have overestimated his own popularity and whether that might show in the future anyway. Miata? Yeah, I mean, look, he's going to have to face his uh, selectorate and electorate at some point. Mm. Um, and I think, in the end, uh, when you kind of flip from one party to the other, the thing that your constituents and voters will ask is, what do you stand for? Mm. Um, and in the end, political parties are rooted in values and are rooted in a vision of how they want to take the country. Um, and all he's telling us is that he's not clear about what values he has or he's not clear about what direction he wants to, to the country, which I think is hugely problematic for him. Right, well, we're going to try and speak to him later on in the programme. But first of all, let's turn to the Conservative leadership contest. Um, we have some breaking news. We obviously know that Matt Hancock, the Health Secretary, has pulled out. But let's show you the front pages, first of all. The front runner, Boris Johnson, the Daily Express. Who can stop Boris now? We then have the Daily Mail... One foot in number 10. The Metro headlines Johnson odds on and the Daily Telegraph. Tory vanity candidates urged to quit. Um, let's invite my colleague, uh, BBC political correspondent Jonathan Blake, um, onto the set now. I've mentioned, obviously, that Matt Hancock has dropped out and we'll talk about the consequences of that and where his supporters might go. But first of all, we have some other news about the debates. Yes, Boris Johnson's going to do the BBC debate. Uh, it's just been confirmed in the last few minutes. So 
after days of complaints from his opponents and a lot of questions from some Conservative MPs and, and more broadly uh, about Mr Johnson's willingness to take on his opponents and willingness to put himself up for scrutiny in the media, it seems that he and his campaign have decided uh, to bite the bullet and do it. Folded under pressure? Matt Hancock? No, Boris Johnson doing the <laughs> debate. <laughs> um, uh, I think... Uh, I think that one, one of the reasons Boris may have announced this so quickly after Matt Hancock withdrew is to try and discourage the others from with, any others from withdrawing. I think he wants a debate and I think he looks more prime ministerial if there are lots of these minnows nipping at his heels during that debate. It was the same rationale that David Cameron went through when he agreed to the debate back in 2015. It holds risks though, doesn't it, for Boris Johnson? Well, it does hold risks. I mean, we know he's run this very controlled, quiet campaign. You know, there's been an almost media blackout, really. He's taken very few questions. Um, and he said himself at the end of last year that, you know, he worries about tripping himself up. So it is a risk. But actually, it's interesting that he's chosen to do the second televised debate and not the first because you know as we've seen in in the US presidential elections you know nominees tend to get really bruised and battered mm. in these things I don't think we know for sure about the first but certainly well, he's only confirmed as, as things this stand, one yeah, as yeah, things yeah, stand yeah, yeah, um, so you know he'll be able to sort of see them bruise and batter each other um, on Sunday night assuming that he doesn't take part um, and then come in next week sort of slightly more untainted and let's face it the, the, le the less he says in debates the less they have to take him to task over is this a good thing will you be watching I will be watching of course yeah I think it's interesting in so much as Linton Crosby, who we're told has a pretty large role in his campaign, is known as a kind of debater-phobe. He's not a fan of them. He tries to win campaigns by the slice of margins, kind of a 52-48 strategy. The fact that Boris Johnson is involved in this debate has surprised me, but it also means he has more confidence in, in his abilities than perhaps Linton Crosby would generally uh, want from his candidates. So, we'll see. Right. Well, Linton Crosby obviously being a political advisor, campaign uh, manager. In terms of the risks, though, why, why does Boris really have to, Boris Johnson have to do this when he's so far ahead? Well, an empty chair, an empty podium doesn't look good. Mm. And, and clearly the calculation has been so far that his campaign is run on the basis of we don't mess up. We're in front by a long way and we don't do anything to jeopardise what is a very healthy margin of victory. Uh, maybe he would have got away with missing the debate uh, on Sunday, uh, but to miss two in a row, I think, you know, the questions and the criticism would have only grown. Uh, and his supporters up to now have made the point that this is a contest among Tory MPs. It's not a national contest, although the winner obviously will end up being Prime Minister and the once you get into the second stage and the vote goes to the Tory members, that will be the time to take a national platform and take the debate more widely. But clearly, they've taken the view that they don't want these questions about his lack of scrutiny to dominate, mm. uh, and he's going to do it. And they I were beginning to. I think another consideration must be that, you know, Boris Johnson has these two big messages um, that he thinks it's absolutely essential to get the UK out of the European Union by October 31st. But so do many of the other to, candidates, to be well, honest. Well, they're, they're less uh, unequivocal about being prepared to leave with no deal. They're more, they're, they're more equivocal than him. Um, but the other big message is, you know, I, I'm the only person that can save the country from Jeremy Corbyn, and if you vote for Jeremy Corbyn, it would be disastrous for these reasons. He wants those messages to land. This is going to get a lot of viewers, so this is a great opportunity to talk to the British public. Well, let, yes, go on, Tony, look, we're not just electing the future leader of the Tory party, we're electing the next Prime Minister. That will be the Prime Minister at a really difficult and perilous time for the country. And it's not just about Brexit and how we break the impasse, but it's all the other challenges that we're not talking about that we will need to confront and tackle after Brexit. So I'm sure so you a divided country, an economy that's not working for the majority of people. And in the end, that is the question. And the question is whether Boris Johnson is the prime minister that's going to knit the country back together, a guy that's called black people pickaninnies, that's likened uh, Muslim women to letterboxes, whether he can bridge the politics of divide in order to do that. A question about whether he's got the plan and the vision. It worries me that the only proposals we've had for him is a tax cut for the rich, which shows he doesn't understand the scale of the economic challenge. And a question of whether he has the depth, the tact, the diplomacy to navigate through all of this. And his record as foreign secretary, I fear, suggests he doesn't. So the big worry for us is that we're choosing our next prime minister. We need all of this stuff from our next prime minister. And we have yet to see that this man is a person that can deliver against Well, let's life. see what policy platform he sets out. But because of those questions you've raised, they are important questions. He should be asked them, and this is an opportunity to ask them. The audience, I think, will have an opportunity to ask the candidates questions. Uh, but, you know, he did serve as a unifying mayor of London for eight years. And his track record um, as foreign secretary. And, well, but I think, I think, I think, I think if, you're, if, you're, if your question is, <clears> can he unite the country, can he bridge those divides, he did that as mayor of London. Well, I think that's an important point, actually, because his team will no doubt feel that actually 
actually he has been stress tested in a lot of these areas, albeit he does have questions to answer now and he absolutely should. But a lot of the other candidates, let's not forget, are much lesser known. And Boris probably feels like he has been stress tested. And they'll have the opportunity, obviously, to shine or not mm. in that debate. Um, let's return to Matt Hancock having pulled out of the race. There was speculation he was going to do so. Um, let's just hear about his, his reason. Well, I'm talking to all of the other candidates uh, and um, I've set out very clearly both in the campaign uh, and um, now as I withdraw from the campaign what really matters in terms of being pro-business, pro-enterprise and uh, a politics that brings people together. And I'll be talking to all the other candidates about uh, how they can best do that. Playing hard to get, Jonathan. Um, I mean, obviously, he has got 20 supporters um, and they will have to go elsewhere. Um, and that will be critically important for people like Sajid Javid, for example. Definitely. I don't think they'll shift as one block, as a unit, because at this stage in the contest, I think Matt Hancock was an outsider uh, and he was clearly pleased to get the level of support he did. Um, and it may be that some gave him their backing just to kind of nudge things on and, and, and allow him to continue. Uh, I don't think if you look down the list of those who came out in support for Matt Hancock, they're necessarily natural Boris Johnson supporters, but some of them might just think, well, now's the time to back the winner, purely in self-interest, if, if nothing mm. else. But, yeah, Matt Hancock offering himself up there and, and saying, come and talk to me to the other candidates. Let's just have a look and show our viewers the numbers so far, because Boris Johnson is out in head. There's an argument that he can't be stopped. Um, Jeremy Hunt is second, followed by Michael Gobe on 37, um, down to Rory Stewart, who was unlikely but has got through um, on 19. I mean, why is Dominic Raab still in the contest, do you think? Most people would probably assume um, there are lots of ardent Brexiteers backing Boris Johnson. You know, what is he offering that's any different? Well, that's the question, I think, that is facing him and his campaign now. He's not a natural quitter. Uh, he, I think, would paint himself as a sort of determined politician who, who doesn't give up. Um, but if you look at what he said yesterday, it was interesting because he, he effectively said this is Boris's race to lose and he may well slip mm. up at some point. Um, so I think that's his best hope now, is that Boris Johnson somehow does something to throw away his massive lead in the contest uh, and his own personality and character gets the better of him and Dominic Raab can somehow sweep around the outside and hoover up all those Brexiteer votes. But if you look at where he is in the contest, it's, it's highly unlikely and I don't think he'll last much longer. I think, given how dominant Boris is, the question is what candidate can stop Boris? It's clearly not Matt Hancock, it's clearly not Dominic Raab. So I think the other MPs who, who aren't fans of Boris are going to coalesce around a story top Boris candidate. That's likely to be Michael Gove, but I think the worry is that if it is Michael Gove and it ends up as them as the final two, we'll have a repeat of the psychodrama mm. that was played out during the last Tory leadership election. Right, well, yes, that was the psychodrama that lots of people, no doubt, in associations are going to be thinking about to mm. some extent. Does it matter who's in second place uh, the in the final two with Boris Johnson? Oh, it does matter. It absolutely does matter, especially the people, as Toby says, who want to stop Boris candidate. I mean, assuming that Matt Hancock's, if we imagine that all of his 20 votes went to, say, Sajid, who's, who's uh, team he had meetings with yesterday, who's probably rather stinging today, actually, mm. that he's saying he's going to take a few days to make his mind up. That would take him to 43, um, which would put him level pegging at the moment with Jeremy Hunt. Um, so that would open up a really interesting race. It absolutely does matter who's second, yes. And I think perhaps we might see more debates when we've got the final two. Um, so we need somebody who can who can stand up and we've got a good contrast to choose from. Right. In terms of Labour fearing which candidate, I mean, presumably they think in their minds that Boris is obviously it's his to lose. Who else do you think in the final two would be difficult for Labour? I don't think any of them would be. I mean, Boris's majority, I think, is 5,500. Uh, so it's not even... For sure that he would even retain his seat necessarily. It's not marginal, but it's perfectly plausible. Mm. I think the first PM that would lose his mm. seat since 1906. You've got uh, Michael Gove, formerly at education, despised by teachers. You've got Jeremy Hunt, formerly at uh, health, despised by uh, doctors and nurses. And you've got Boris Johnson, a former foreign secretary, broadly speaking, despised by the rest of the world. So. I really don't mind which person wins. <laughs> I'm, I'm perfectly confident that Labour, with a very positive message about the big issues of the day, climate change, the future of the economy, demographic ageing, and, yes, of course, Brexit, I think have far more of a vision to offer to the British people. I think one of the reasons Boris is so far out in front is because most Conservative MPs think he has the best hope of beating mm. Labour at the next general election, and that's borne out by all the opinion polls. And also Nigel Farage and the threat from the Brexit party. Mm. Yeah, I mean, if you look at the margin Boris Johnson has after that first ballot among MPs uh, and, and having 
talked to many of them in the early stages of this race, um, the, the argument that we're backing Boris Johnson because he can win an election is one that comes up time and time again. Uh, and that may be the thinking uh, for a lot of MPs who are supporting him beyond his record, beyond the policies he's put forward, beyond his character. Frankly, uh, it comes down to are we going to lose our seat come the next general election, whenever that may be. And if they see him as the best chance of securing that, uh, then it, it's an argument that pretty much trumps everything else for It's odd. It's um, Boris, in a sense, is the safety first candidate. He's, mm -hmm. he's best placed to see off the Farage threat and then best placed to defeat Corbyn. If you're risk averse, if, you're, if, you're, if you want to put safety first, weirdly, Boris Johnson is the candidate to go for. So I think the Strange mistake times. the Conservative Party made in the 2017 election is that they thought it was about personality and they thought it was about, you know, the vision of May, this figure, and not about the issues and not about the vision and the plan for the country. And the fact that they didn't do particularly well, given where they were in the polls, I think was a recognition of that. So I think if the Conservative Party are putting their cards in the personality politics of Briggs, Boris, they will make exactly the same mistake. Because if he doesn't have a plan, if he doesn't have a vision, if he doesn't have an offer to the country beyond I have some answers on Brexit that we're not quite clear what are, he will be... He will struggle in an election. I, I, I agree, and I think there will be a policy platform put forward. But don't you think that Labour's also making a mistake of trying to attack him on personality grounds? They're throwing all these things he said in the past, beavering away, doing offence. It's not just Labour that are throwing those things. Uh, they are rival, well, candidates, some rival candidates, too. candidates But none of that worked in t 2008, right. 2012. It didn't work in 2016. It's not going to work next time. Just a bit more detail on what Boris Johnson is planning to do in an in a, uh, interview uh, with The World at One on Radio 4. He has given his reasons, saying that in the past he's taken the view that the public are fed up with blue-on-blue -blue action and didn't want to hear too much squabbling among the candidates, but now he's said the right time to offer the country uh, the best debate would be at the time of the second ballot on Tuesday, and he says the best forum is the proposed BBC debate, and he thinks that's a good idea. So it looks like he will skip the one on Channel 4 on Sunday and go straight to that debate on Tuesday. Jonathan, thank you very much. Now, do you have any questions for the Prime Minister, the new one, that is? Because on Tuesday the 18th of June, we've now had it confirmed, BBC One will be hosting a live election hustings between the candidates for Conservative leader, including Boris Johnson. Their debate will be shaped by your questions, and we're asking you to submit them in advance. Email have your say at bbc.co.uk with your question and include your name and contact number if you're interested in asking it live on the night from your local BBC studio. Get email. Now, we're now going to move on and talk about Grenfell because it's two years since that terrible fire at Grenfell Tower which claimed the lives of 74 people. A church service has been held in North Kensington this morning to commemorate those who died. And yet, in terms of a policy response, thousands of faulty fire doors haven't yet been replaced despite promises made after the disaster. Miata, your thoughts? Yeah, so, look, it's a huge tragedy, um, and I think it's a massive stain. But for me, you know, Grenfell is emblematic of a system that is just failing too many people in this country. Um, and austerity, which in some respects was a kind of factor in this, is just symptomatic of that. Um, and the fact that actually we're not providing enough care for people who are less well-off in our uh, communities. So we had a renovation that was done by a private company on the cheap, where concern and thought about the safety and the quality of accommodation of people living in these towers was not primary. We had governments that failed to regulate and put standards to ensure people were protected. We had residents that were just ignored as if they were second-class citizen. And I think the response has been woeful and tells us a lot. So, you know, the pace at which people were rehoused, uh, the fact that there are 200 buildings Buildings that are still uh, um, uncladded. Mm. And so, for me, it is about actually how we treat people and how we care people who, uh, for people who are less well-off in our society. And two years on, it kind of doesn't feel like anything has changed. And also the fact the Met said this week that there's no guarantee that criminal char charges will ever be brought. I mean, that must be a real blow to people two years on. I think blaming austerity is... I agree, it's, there's a lot of uh, play here. I feel like it's too simplistic. I feel like it's too, twofold. Obviously, there is uh, some blame to be thrown at central government. I mean, de building deregulation, um, how long it's taken for this pot to reclad uh, the buildings to be made available, obviously cuts to the emergency services. Um, but also, I worry that laying the blame on austerity takes away from the individual responsibility and accountability that needs to be put on people and organisations that neglected these people and their buildings and set this chain of events in 
action. Do you agree with that? Jeremy Corbyn at the time, Aaron, um, said that Grenfell Fire highlighted the disastrous mm. effects of austerity. Is it emblematic of austerity? I think it is emblematic of austerity, but I would also add it was negligence in so much as regulations after the 1980s were very much about self-regulation. There was a decisive change in building standards in the 1980s. And then an addendum to that, the tenants of this building for years were saying quite explicitly, there are problems here, this is a fire trap, uh, and they were ignored. And we often talk in, in the media about voice for working class people. They articulated their problems and they were ignored. And I would agree with Miata that was because they are working class people. They are not people from powerful positions. One thing to bear in mind, Aaron, is that um, they were ignored largely by the Kensington and Chelsea Tenants Management Organisation. And one of the people who sat on that organisation was Emma Dentko, the Labour MP for Kensington. But I don't think we should try and play politics. Well, but you have. Have. you have. Exactly. Well, I think, I think we should, I'm think not blaming the Tories or Labour. I'm blaming saying. austerity, it seems to me. It's like, I went back to the 1980s. If you, if you want to stop this kind of thing happening, you should vote Labour. I mean, there is an independent inquiry Silly. currently oh. underway. And one of the purposes of that is so we have a definitive answer about who's to blame, what the causes mm -hmm. were, and how we can prevent this happening in future. And that's not due to report until October of this year. So we should, we should withhold judgment about who to blame. Right. Moment. Well, it, who to blame is one thing. Being emblematic of austerity is something slightly different. I mean, if the government was taking the issue seriously, wouldn't they have done the works that they promised would be done as quickly as possible? And wouldn't all the buildings have been made safe in the way they said they would be? Well, clearly, the, the, if, if they have been neglecting to do that, then they should do it. And there was this fire in Barking over the weekend, oh. which looked pretty serious. Um, but I think, I think this narrative that Britain is this impoverished country, uh, that the economy's not working for everyone, that it's emblematic of that. I mean, you know, I challenge that, you know, that, 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 that there have never been more people in employment. Uh, this government has taken millions of people out of tax. Um, uh, you know, the economy is thriving, GDP is increasing, none of the uh, uh, prognostications of doom by the Project Fear have come to pass. Our economy is actually growing faster than many other European economies. The uh, national debt as a percentage of GDP is falling. I mean, Broadly speaking, economically, we're a successful country. So the economy is growing, but the majority of people aren't benefiting from it. But and real this wages is not are a, it's increasing. Let, let, let wages have been wages, increased. wages have been stagnant for a decade. Oh. So and it's, this is not they a political point. Yeah, but they're playing Every, catch up. From the Conservatives through to Labour, everyone is saying that the economy is not working, and they're saying it because they can see what's being felt in the country. The fact that people feel that it's not working, the fact that we have families that are working, working multiple jobs sometimes, and can't put food on the table for their children. They can't heat their homes. There are 14 million people in this country living in poverty, 1.5 million in destitution. These aren't a fabrication. This is the reality out there. You step outside of London, you step outside of the Westminster bubble, this is the reality in the country, and we've got to confront that. And the more that there are people and commentators just pretending this thing is not happening, the more problematic it is, because it means we're not rising to the scale of the challenge well, that we have in the country. I think a challenge for the next Prime Minister is to try and make sure, to quote Theresa May, the country works for everyone, not just for uh, those in the South East and in London and in the successful parts of the country. But it's not true, I don't think, to say that you know, everyone agrees that the economy is failing. I mean, OK, real wages were stagnant for a long time, but now they're increasing. Uh, GDP is increasing. The national debt is falling as a percentage of GDP. I mean, economic Economically speaking, things are going reasonably is, well. Aaron, is this the conversation that will be going on um, for people who are commemorating Grenfell today? In part because there are grotesque failures of public policy in this country that extend beyond work but also include work. And I think people are politically savvy enough, and that's why they were engaging with these problems and trying to highlight them before they even happened. Uh, and I think it would be remiss to say they aren't aware of them at a mass level as well. But I just want to quickly say on the economy, UK productivity, output per hour work, broadly speaking, stayed the same for 10 years. That is to say, somebody watching this, on average, they are producing the same amount of output as they were a decade ago. Wages flat, GDP per capita flat, measured by dollars, down. So even by the metrics that the status quo, the establishment, want to be judged by, wages, productivity, GDP, it's going nowhere. And that isn't a political point. It's just a, it's an empirical observation. It's a fact. Right. Let's have a look at some of the pictures because green is the colour uh, for Grenfell. Um, Downing Street was bathed in green light overnight from dusk until dawn. We're talking to some extent about the politics of division. Um, Theresa May talked about tackling the burning injustices. <coughs> there, there is the tower itself uh, with green light. Grenfell forever in our hearts. And people will look to the policy response since then to see if it is is actually being taken seriously and there are some of the commemorations um, and also obviously the church service this morning where I think Sadiq Khan and also the minister James Brokenshire is also there. Um, 
people will be thinking about those who lost their lives, but after today, where does it go? Well, I think quite a few people will be feeling cynical about Downing Street being bathed in green light when, you know, central government's lack of response to the 170 buildings that still need cladding um, has taken two years and you've had sort of private landlords trying to charge leaseholders for it in the meantime. Um, you know, I saw a news report the other day where there are people still living in tower blocks uh, with this flammable cladding who are too frightened to sleep which really astonished me. They have set up a sort of night watch and they're patrolling the corridors of their homes every night at 2am, 3am because they're scared that something's going to happen. So I think those, on the ground, those sorts of issues would be really sort of, you know, for forefront in people's minds today and this week. Let's move on. Time for something else. Now, the world's most important video game show, E3, has been taking place in Los Angeles this week, and at least one of the blockbuster titles is offering a provocative take on Brexit Britain. Here's Mark Chislak from the BBC's tech programme, Click. Watchdog's Legion is set in a post-Brexit dystopian near-future London. Had a good run there for a while. Now it's all riots, <laughs> bombings, And people thrown in cages like animals. A bleak surveillance state where abusive technology has led to huge unemployment, a privatised NHS and massive levels of civil unrest. It's not a particularly flattering picture of Britain. Before E3, I went behind the scenes at its developers Ubisoft's studios in Toronto, Canada. The Brexit vote happened when we were a year and a half into development. We'd already settled on London as a location and a big important decision for us was to, you know, address it head-on and say, yep, this is just part of our world and our backstory. Brexit in our game is not uh, sort of the cause of the problems that we're depicting in the game world. Brexit, uh, the causes of Brexit really are the causes of the problems in our world, and that's really how we address it. Here at E3, Watch Dogs, despite or perhaps because of its themes, has gone down exceedingly well. But games taking their inspiration from headlines in the British press has caused some to wonder if this is a reflection of how the rest of the world views the UK's current situation. We have video games about the apocalypse, we have nuclear disasters, we have world wars, and now we have Brexit, which really means that the rest of the world is looking at Brexit as a legitimate disaster. And that's quite fascinating in the fact that it's something that we should be taking seriously. It's not something that's just happening on our stage, it's happening on the world stage, and that's particularly very interesting and kind of scary. Watch Dogs isn't the only game here to take its inspiration from headlines and events in the UK. Call of Duty Modern Warfare features a terrorist attack in London's Piccadilly Circus, a move which many industry observers have questioned. Video games can address the same types of subjects that movies, film and TV can, can tackle for sure, if it's handled with the right care. But the same thing applies to these other types of medium, you know, of media as well. If, there, if, it's, if the subject matter is not handled uh, with sensitivity, and uh, deftly, then anything could be sort of off limits. But if handled correctly and handled with respect and reverence, I think that, the, that, that there's no reason why games can't tackle those same types of subjects. Art, movies, literature and music all tackle difficult and challenging subject matter. Often it's a way of helping us better understand our world. And now it seems the same is true of video games. How seriously should we take this, uh, Toby Young, the idea of the game being based on post-Brexit Britain? Yeah, well, I mean, you know, as a, as a Brexit supporter, you know, the temptation is to uh, become all buffed and tuftenish about this and outraged that they're portraying Brexit as being such a disaster when actually, so far, no disaster has materialised. I think it's symptomatic of something I wrote about in The Spectator recently, which is the migration of what Richard Hofstadter, an American political scientist, called the paranoid style. The paranoid style, these feverish apocalyptic fantasies, these conspiracy theories, used to be something which was true of the populist right. But since Brexit and since Trump's victory in 2016, the paranoid style, these paranoid apocalyptic fever dreams, seem to have migrated. Mm. These conspiracy theories have migrated to, to the Bastani. left, and this feels like <laughs> an example of that. Do you agree, Aaron? Um, no, I think, I mean, the, the piece was quite keen to highlight that Brexit isn't the primary cause of that video game. And I do think over the next several decades, we're going to see a wave of crises. I talked about them already. Ageing, climate change, automation, uh, the continued breakdown of neoliberalism. 
and it will lead to, I think, quite dystopian outcomes. I don't think like that, because I think we'll probably increasingly exhibit features like the Chinese state, where you have all-seeing consumer surveillance synergised with state surveillance. Your payment system is also a social network which can find you because of face recognition. So I doubt the explosions and all the kind of interesting costumes, but I do think that confluence of crises, meeting big data in a potentially authoritarian state, authoritarian form of capitalism, could be quite concerning. And I'll just finish with this. In 2015, uh, SpaceX landed the first ever autonomously piloted first stage rocket, December 2015. Two months earlier, Alan Kurdi was washed up on the beaches of Bodrum, a three-year-old child trying to come into Europe. So we don't need to imagine the fever dreams, the speculations of science fiction. That dystopia of a future which isn't evenly distributed is already here. The question is for people on the left, and I hope people on the right as well, in whose interests? And what that kind of speculative fiction allows us is to say, well, the world is really going to change. Do we want to change it for the better or for the worse? What do you think, Toby? Do you think that's true? I mean, do you think that gaming and the world of gaming is the right forum or can take these sort of serious themes and put it into any sort of context? Well, I mean, it feels... It doesn't feel particularly serious. And I think uh, the idea that neoliberalism is propelling us towards this uh, dystopian, apocalyptic, nightmare future, I, say I would take issue with. I said it's one crisis amongst several. But I, think, I, think, I think, you know, um, uh, something's happened <clears throat> in the last 300 years to raise everyone out of the squalor we lived in for millennia before that. What is it? It's capitalism. And the miracle of capitalism keeps on giving. In, in, since 1990, over a billion people across the world have been raised out of extreme poverty. But it and sounds in one like you are alone, taking it seriously. You are taking You are trying to formulate well, an think, argument think, to counter think, what's being well, said in this, in well, this dystopian it, game. It feels like another manifestation of a dystopian satire emerging from mass culture, but none of these dystopian satires have actually materialised. Right, I mean, it's big industry, though, isn't it? it and is. taking on Brexit in the way that the creative director says, however, the causes of Brexit, which are real and important things, are the causes of the problems in our world. And we've turned those problems up to 11. Well, I mean, as, as your film said, it's not the first game to emerge from the headlines and it certainly won't be the last. I think any controversy might actually come from the fact that the uh, makers of it seem to be trying to distance themselves from the fact it's pegged to the causes of Brexit. Um, that, might, that might cause a bit of a stir, you know, with those who disagree. Um, I think, I mean, how amazing it would be if gaming was the thing that united the left and right eventually. Who <laughs> It could happen. What, put these two together? Could create that a game. utopia for us all. <laughs> yeah. what well, look, I actually think it was interesting that the creator said that it was about the causes of Brexit. And actually, I think culture, whether it's gaming, whether it's different forms of the arts, trying to kind of engage people in the issues is really, really helpful. And for me, you know, it, it may not be the dystopia, but the underlying drivers of Brexit, you know, yes, there were people who voted for the European Union, but for a lot of people, it was despair and discontent with the economic system. With an economic system that, you know, still benefits a tiny proportion of people where people aren't feeling the benefit in the majority. And the problem in all of the debate of the last three years is that we've got away from that. And we're not talking about those issues and we're not talking about how we need to respond. We're talking about the ins and outs of whether we leave or how we leave. And that is a problem. And if it takes the gaming industry to sort of shine a spotlight on that, Thank you very much. I'm, I'm, I, I mean, if you look at actually who voted for Brexit, it was a huge, broad cross-section of people across British society, across every socio-economic group, across every ethnic group, in every region of the country. I think to characterise it as just being a kind of cry of discontent no. from the uh, underprivileged is No, no, is, is there, there was a coalition, but... For a sizable proportion of that coalition and the numbers that were decisive for it to be a leave versus a remain, it was a call for change. It was about a rejection of the status quo and a demand for something different. Yeah, and national in the sovereignty. End, well, yes, sovereignty to what end? You've got to go back to the fundamental issues and address how we make people's lives better. And just saying we're going to leave and it's OK is not good enough. What happens beyond leaving? And that is the fundamental question, and I think that's the issue that they're trying to get at. I mean, listen to the people behind these games. Is this how the rest of the world sees Brexit? I doubt it. I think people generally either dislike Britain or they like Britain in like most countries. They look at Britain as quirky, eccentric, um, lovable or a former imperialist power. I I think most people, even those that don't like Britain, probably look at what's happened in the last several years and go, 
wow, these are the people that administered the largest empire in the history of humanity. I hope Genghis Khan doesn't come and visit me in my dreams. And they're, they're surprised at <laughs> Thanks how, for revealing that. How, how badly it's being politically managed. Also, I, I slightly object to this argument that oh, Brexit must be a bad thing because people in other countries, look at the New York Times and the way it's covered it, we're being humiliated in the eyes of the world. This is dreadful. <clears throat> I, as a good parent, I'm trying to teach my children not to do what they think other people will admire or approve of, but to do what they think is right. And I think that's how we should proceed, not according to what's likely to get three cheers in the New York Times editorial pages. Well, let's have a look at your vision for the future. Um, <laughs> cover of your book, Fully Automated Luxury Communism. Yeah. Well, that is a title, I have to <laughs> say, um, Aaron Bastani. Um, but you are sort of accepting AI um, mm. and robots taking over hundreds of thousands of jobs, mm. but it's OK. Yeah, I mean, I, the, the book is really composed of three parts. The, the start is really what we've already been talking about, really, crises. I won't reiterate what I talk about. Um, I talked about just a moment ago. And then I say, but at the same time, over the last several decades, we see the emergence of a range of technologies, renewable energy, synthetic biology, um, cellular agriculture, automation, AI, etc. And this can actually create a new found abundance, which should be subordinated to universal basic services, freely available to everyone, rather than... Uh, just compounding profits of the already powerful. Now, what Toby will say, if you'll allow me to ventriloquise you, you'll say, well, this is only possible because of capitalism. And in part, he's right. My point is that increasingly this abundance will find itself at odds with the core tenets of capitalism, which is workers have to sell their labour for a wage. Well, algorithmic learning, AI could undermine that. And production for profit, where you have things which are getting permanently cheaper, permanent deflation. It's very hard to sell things for a profit on a market through prices. I think if... Um, I don't think you quite captured my... <laughs> with, uh, Aaron, um, uh, my objection is with the word communism. Um, if you look at various attempts... Luxury to, or otherwise. Luxury or otherwise, you know, to replace, commun to replace capitalism with something better, fairer, more socially just in the 20th century, well, actually, it resulted in the deaths of over 100 million people. Jeremy Corbyn, on The Mar Show last year, praised Chairman Mao's Great Leap Forward, which was the forced collectivisation of agriculture between 58 and 62. Can that I... resulted in an estimated 45 million deaths. Yeah, well... well, it's never worked before. <sighs> Why is it going to work again, just if we add a bit of high tech? Well, the thing is, like I say, the book starts with these crises, and I find it instructive that people on the right are more willing to talk about the shortcomings of the Russian Revolution, the Russian Civil War, 1917 to 21, rather than... Let's talk about Venezuela. Well, rather than, well, OK, we can talk about Venezuela. It's not certainly not communism. Rather than declining crop yields because of climate change, rather than glacier water basically disappearing in South Asia, meaning several billion people can't get clean drinking water, rather than a crisis of ageing, which means that taxpayer-funded social welfare systems will no longer function, uh, rather than uh, a panoply of crises, which we're seeing on the horizon, automation changing, the developmental trajectory. So, ten years ago, we would have thought all the jobs in China today, the labour costs are too high, they'll go to Nigeria. What we're seeing instead, because of automation, the jobs stay there, it's just robots do them. So, for Nigeria, Indonesia, Pakistan, that's hugely troubling. And Toby's think, talking about 1917. I think, Aaron, there's no question that uh, there are problems facing us, problems we have to address, but I think the people to rely on, the system to rely on to address those problems is the free market, free enterprise system, which has raised so many people out of poverty, not communism, which plunges people into poverty, which resulted, as I say, in over 100 million unnecessary deaths during the 20th century and is continuing to kill people to this day in Venezuela. So I think there are different iterations of uh, capitalism and the free market neoliberal uh, system that we've had for the last 40 years. I think there's a question about whether it's hit the limits and the bounds of what it can do. Um, and the logic, you know, the beauty of that free market model, the promise of that free market model was this idea of trickle down. Just let the markets do what they like and they will distribute fairly. Every Everyone will do better. That is no longer the case. And at some point, you have to confront the fact that this system just isn't working. And if it's not working for people, it won't withstand it. So people like you can say all you like, this is the right system. If the public don't believe it, the political pressure for change will be immense. And I think that's the debate. And when you throw in the disruption that will come from automation, you throw in the disruption that will come from climate change, this will create the conditions for us thinking about a very different system. That should be the conversation. But, Beata, in one year alone, 2013, 100 million people were raised out of extreme poverty. 
Why? Because of the global spread of free market capitalism to, to India, to Africa, to Asia. That, isn't that an example of everyone benefiting from the free enterprise system? Over 100 million people in a single year being raised out of extreme poverty. So, What's that? I, it's I, not a benefit. I would argue that when you dig under that, then actually it's about policy intervention. So very often the thing that's raised people are governments intervening to educate people, intervening to look after people. So if you let the free market roll on its own, it won't do the job. And there's always this balance. And the question is whether we have gone too far in one direction or another. I'm afraid or... socialism always begins with a universal vision for the brotherhood of man and ends with people having to eat their own pets. Right. That's, oh, that's charming. Right. Let's um, <laughs> invite Tatton Spiller with that thought away from our minds. He is the founder of Simple Politics. Welcome to the programme. And it's oh. a project um, that aims to explain and engage people with politics, both online and via talks. Um, you've been a teacher yep. and a journalist. You've worked at the Houses of Parliament. Yep. Um, educating visiting school students. Now, on this programme, we try and tackle all the uh, political issues, particularly ones about communism versus uh, capitalism. But let's go back to some of our more red meat, if you like, in terms of Tory uh, leadership contests. Um, and we can show, I think, some of the things that you've done um, and try to simplify for people uh, in terms of complicated things like the World Trade Organisation, for example. But while that is going up, tell us what it is, in a nutshell, simple politics. Simple Politics does exactly what it says on the tin. It's an attempt to help people understand and engage with politics in a way that's clear, accurate and impartial so that they can find out what's going on, find out what the different people are saying, see who they agree with, but crucially, understand people with whom they disagree rather than just being in your own echo, cha echo chamber and getting angry and shouting and calling people fascists or trots or, or whatever, whatever the language happens to be. It's about people understanding each other. It's about debating with more humanity and more communication and more listening. Do you think it's working? In its own way, yes. <laughs> I mean, it, there's, a, there, there's clearly some way to go. I mean, everybody really thinks that the debate, certainly since Brexit, has been punctuated by people in echo chambers. Do you think this sort of medium will help people understand better their opponents? Oh, I'd like to think it would. I mean, we were talking about dystopias a few minutes ago. I mean, this is, this is our utopia now, isn't it? A place where, you know, people are not in their echo chamber and actually we can have reasoned debate and conversation about topics and people who say something that somebody else doesn't like, doesn't get, you know, don't get shut down immediately, kicked off Twitter, suspended from their jobs, whatever it might be. I mean, do you think Toby Young and Aaron Bastani occupy echo chambers too, in a too limited way instead of reaching out? I think Navarra Media and The Spectator are certainly places where people who are in echo chambers might like to hang out. I wouldn't Very dream of uh, <laughs> dream of insulting either of these two. Uh, but I, I think one of the Don't things worry, which... Don't worry, it's two against one. <laughs> I'm, here, I'm here to protect you. <laughs> one of the things which distinguishes The Spectator is we always publish people of different points of view to the dominant editorial point of view. So, for instance, leading the website at the moment is a piece by Nick Cohen on why Boris would be such a disaster. But I think what you're doing is fantastic. I mean, I, I believe in classical liberal education, and I think the purpose of education ultimately is to equip children to participate in those conversations mankind has been having with itself for the past 2,000 years. And to do that they need to value the values of the enlightenment reason logic evidence and they need to they need to value civility i think civility in debate is incredibly important well, so what not, he's doing is fantastic but that's not what has been coming through do you not think you are perpetuating the echo chamber people are angry about things and you say we agree with you let me show you something that'll make you even angry well this is politics live it's always a bit of a punch and judy show isn't it well, well no, it's not just politics, politics. They're they're not just politics yeah. as you have been but in terms of the, the sort of politics that you occupy. Is that making it worse? Are you only encouraging people to get even more annoyed about what they already feel? I mean, I think at Navarra, we, I think we generally publish, we do podcasts with peer-reviewed academics, researchers, top writers. We did a, a podcast last Friday with a gentleman who's just written a, a history of neoliberalism. And we do try and couch these broader debates, which can fall into that. We do try and couch them in a more analytical historical context and I would answer really in brief people are angry that anger is justified let's provide them with an analytical framework as to why things are the way they are and how we can change them within the parameters of a democratic system which respects freedom of speech freedom of expression and uh, fundamental human rights I mean going back to some of the things you're saying about people not doing the sort of traditional things they used to sitting around one television talking about exactly. politics I mean, does that make a big difference? It makes a huge difference, because when there's one screen in your house and it's got three, four <laughs> or five channels, you watch the news, maybe just because it's between casualty and match of the day, you watch the news in a group. And 
share your opinions and your opinions are challenged because no one agrees with their parents on anything, right? <laughs> so your opinions are immediately challenged. Whereas today, where you've got your own screen and you've got your own specified news feed and you've got all of that going on, they're not challenged the same way. From all of us here, bye-bye.